Def definitely our unsung heroes. Now, many of you have been wondering what happens inside an ICU. We leave you with this story prepared by Beldin Weleola about life inside an ICU. The public's attention has recently been drawn to capacity and quality of critical care units in the country. This is because critically ill patients with the coronavirus often require such attention. But what is it like in an ICU? Dr. Wangare Sika, a critical care specialist at the Aga Khan Hospital, is worried that the facilities in Kenya will not be enough should the number of critically ill patients rise. She gives us an insight on critical care and life in an intensive care unit. So my name is Wangare, I'm Dr. Sika, uh, officially. Um, I work in critical care, what most people know as intensive care, or ICU, mm -hmm. as uh, most of us would call it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the ICU, where we currently are, is a room, is, a, is an area that is prepared specifically to help uh, people when they are very sick, mm -hmm. when certain organs are not working well. Mm -hmm. So they are brought to a place like this, and the organ that is not working well is supported. Mm -hmm. Now the ICU in particular is specifically designed to support patients when the breathing is the problem. Mm -hmm. So when your breathing is the problem, then you come to us and we connect you to what is called a life support machine. Uh -huh. So the life support machine, just, just the, yes, okay, so the life support machine, this is one example, there are very many different types, uh -huh. but what it essentially is able to do is take over that work of breathing mm -hmm. so that the act of breathing in and breathing out that is so difficult when you're very sick, the machine does it for you mm -hmm. until whatever disease is making it so difficult for you to breathe has come under control and we can then allow you to go back to breathing for yourself like you and I are doing right now. Mm -hmm. People who get infected with COVID mm -hmm. will have different types of symptoms. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has the same type of disease. Some people will have a mild disease, some will have no disease, and some will have severe disease. So the people who have no disease, of course, will not be in hospital. Those who have mild disease may be at, in hospital or at home. But when you get to the point where breathing is a problem, your oxygen levels are dropping, you're finding it difficult to breathe, then you will be brought to the intensive care unit or the ICU. So we normally would start you off in a ward setting, watching you very closely, but when it becomes clear that your lungs have been taken over by this COVID infection, mm -hmm. then we bring you to the ICU and we help you with your breathing. One of the things we will do, which is standard for all patients, um, if we think outside of COVID, generally in terms of ICU, we always have what is called a patient monitor, which is able to look at the way your heart is beating, your blood pressure, the way you're breathing, etc. And so that is very important. So we call that continuous monitoring. We, we watch your vital signs continuously. But when you now speak about COVID, COVID is highly infectious. And so because it's highly infectious, the way we approach the patient is very different. Um, we will not just walk in and simply wear a mask and, and our normal plastic aprons. We do what is called donning, where we literally ensure there is no exposed part of our bodies at all. We are covered from head to toe with what is called personal protective equipment or PPE that you may have seen mentioned quite a bit. And the reason for that is I do not want the virus that may be in the air to land on any part of your body. So once you have ensured the safety of the people who are going to come into the room that now has a patient who has severe COVID infection and now needs help with breathing, we all enter the room fully donned, fully covered with this protective equipment. And what we do then is take over the breathing by giving the patient some medication to make them a little bit sleepy. And then you put a breathing tube into the windpipe. And through that breathing tube, we're able then to connect you to the machine that then takes over that breathing. The other the ventilators that you That is a out. ventilator, exactly. So people call it life support. Mm -hmm. You're on life support, a life support machine. Yes, that is a ventilator. So this is one, it's not turned on at the moment, but just to explain the principles of it, mm -hmm. a ventilator will, normally if you're taking a breath in, you pull in, you breathe in by pulling in the breath. A ventilator will push in that breath into your body. Mm -hmm. 
So we who work in intensive care will set the machine, the ventilator, such that we tell it how much to push into your body, which is based on your weight. So the amount we'll push into you may not be the same as into me. And how many times we do it per minute, also we will set it as the team that works in intensive care. So we tell the machine, for this patient that I now have here, who has COVID infection, give him this amount of a breath, in terms of liters, this number of times a minute. And keep doing that until further notice. When we do that, we then take blood samples into what is called a blood gas machine and that is able to tell us the purpose of the machine is to bring in oxygen and help us to clear carbon dioxide so the machine will tell us are we giving this patient enough oxygen are we re allowing him to remove the carbon dioxide or is the oxygen too low is the carbon dioxide too high and based on that, we come back and we make further changes. And that is how we help this patient breathe as we wait for the disease process to come under control. The mask that goes on your face usually is where we begin before we put you on life support. When you have COVID infection and you start from mild disease, you may not have problems with your oxygen levels. They may be perfectly okay. But as you get sicker and sicker, the oxygen levels start to drop the first thing we put is the mask, which just gives you oxygen and you continue breathing for yourself, but with extra oxygen, more than is currently available in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And then we continue to monitor you and see, are you managing, are you coping? And we are also looking at you. Mm -hmm. If we then find that you're not coping, then this is no longer helping because you're needing a lot of oxygen and still your oxygen levels are too low or you're getting tired, you're breathing quite fast. So we take that mask away and instead we make you a bit sleepy, put the breathing tube and attach you to the ventilator. And while doing that, again, we ensure you're quite sleepy because it's, it's not a natural thing to have that kind of connection to your body, but it helps the body rest and is part of the healing process. Next to me here, you can see, this is called a CRRT machine. It's called Continuous Renal Replacement Therapy. Patients who have in ICU in general, but even those with COVID, one of the things that we are seeing around the world is that your kidneys can stop working properly. And if your kidneys don't work properly, the next port of call, as we said, ICU is supporting the organs that are not working well. So this supports the kidneys, so it's dialysis which I think most Kenyans will understand. It's dialysis, it's doing the work of the kidney, removing the, 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 the things in your blood that are, are not clean, the impurities, removing the water you are unable to pass. So this takes over as your kidney, as this is taking over as your lungs. So those are, that is how we replace that and support the organs until they are better. Okay. So that is the, for the kidneys. We have obviously a special type of bed so this bed, again, if you look at the side, it gives you a lot of uh, options in terms of how to position the patient because the way you position a patient with COVID, there will be some parts that are the same as ICU patients, but for patients with COVID when they are very, very sick and not responding to whatever we are doing here, is to actually lay them on their tummy lay them on their tummy because it helps the lungs uh, try and work a bit better because they are really, really struggling. And so if you see even pictures from around the world, you'll see people lying on their tummies. It's called going prone, and that has been shown to be of benefit and being done quite early. Mm -hmm. uh, so this bed allows us to do that and do it safely. Mm -hmm. On this side, uh, you can see what are called pumps. So the stack of four at the bottom there, those are called syringe pumps. And what they allow us to do is to prepare medication that is only used in intensive care. It's very strong medication. And it allows us to give it in a very controlled manner, uh, calculating it for the patient uh, in terms of their weight, how much you want to give per minute or per hour, in a way that if you were to hang a bag here, it would be very difficult to to correct, to calculate correctly, and to give correctly. So these are called syringe pumps, because you take a syringe like the one for giving injections, but they are quite big. You connect them here through some tubing to the patient, and they give the medication very slowly because they are very strong drugs, and they need to be adjusted very carefully. Um, this is a different type of pump. It's an infusion pump. These ones now are usually given, used to give, if you have um, to give fluid, for example, the patient has not, is not able to take anything through the mouth, so we are giving them through the drip. 
So we are able to calculate how much we need to give. These ones are used to give things a bit faster. These ones are for quite slow, slow drug medication administration. This one is a feeding pump. So when you have COVID, uh, you're going to have a breathing tube down your throat. You're connected to the life support machine, the ventilator. You still need your energy. You need your calories. You need your protein because that is part of making your body strong enough to fight this nasty infection. Mm -hmm. So this pump allows us to hang the food that will give you the nourishment. Mm -hmm. So once the breathing tube is put into the patient, there's also a feeding tube that goes through the nose, through the food pipe this time, into the stomach. And then we connect that to a bag and we control how much we're giving you per hour and then the patient is able to keep getting nutrition through this period so they don't suffer from the lack of, of any nutrition. There are standards in intensive care for how much protein a patient needs, for how much calorie a patient needs and it's based on their weight, what disease process they have, if they have not been eating before so they have some malnutrition and what day in ICU they are. So we, we, we based on that the feed that we use is commercial, it's not prepared here, it is, it is from companies that have specialized in preparing food for those who are in intensive care or who cannot eat the normal way. And they have told us for this particular type of food, the amount of protein in every, every 100 meals is this. Mm -hmm. Then we say for your weight, you need this amount in a day. And that's how we are able to tell how much for this patient of this weight they need per hour. And that's how we calculate your proteins and your calories. It's, it's very difficult right now, so we are basing a lot of what we are doing on what our colleagues around the world are saying, based on what they are seeing. And the general trend for those who are improving seems to be about 10 days on life support. But I think that is 10 days assuming nothing else uh, crops up. Mm -hmm. So 10 days when it's just COVID and it's been, you know, nothing else has, there's been no other complication, mm -hmm. it, it, it works out to just about a week and a half or so. Mm -hmm. Some are going beyond to two weeks. I think maybe just to mention a bit about the ventilator, that's very, very important even for us as a nation, is that just in the same way um, buying a car doesn't mean you will drive it because you've bought it. You need to have someone who can operate the machine. And so I think the importance of saying that we need to then think about who is going to operate the machines, to operate them safely, and to operate them in a manner that the COVID patient is able to get the kind of care they need depending on where they are in their disease process.